So did flat earthers finally catch us? Did they finally disprove the conventional understanding of eclipses? So globe earthers, explain why that shadow stays the same all day while the sun and the moon both move. We have recently had a total lunar eclipse and it happened just when we predicted. How did we do that? And flat earthers think they caught us. They think they saw the shadow move in the wrong direction and even changed direction. Were they right or were they wrong? You may not have stayed up that night, but I did and I had a wonderful time. There was a total lunar eclipse overnight, March 13th and 14th this year, visible over all the American continents. Here at the Creation Museum, we hosted an eclipse party that night. People arrived a little before midnight and stayed until after 5 a.m. and uh, they were rewarded with a fine time. Turns out the weather was better than I thought it might be. It was mostly clear. We had a few clouds that came through, but I was most concerned about the, how cold it would be, but I know in, here in northern Kentucky in early and mid-March it can be quite chilly. Turns out it didn't get down below 50 degrees, so it was really a pleasant evening, just a few light layers of clothing and we were fine. I set up two of our telescopes to take photographs. I used the Questar uh, telescope we have, a three and a half inch diameter with a 1300 millimeter focal length. Those people who know photography know that's a very good uh, telephoto lens. And I can attach my uh, camera by t removing the camera lens and putting it on the back of the telescope and using that telescope as the camera lens. The other one was a five inch refractor, a Teleview refractor. It's got a 660 millimeter focal length. So it's got a shorter uh, focal length and a bigger field of view. And I attached another camera to that. And overall, I took more than a thousand photographs. <laughs> I was able to get some large angle views of the moon, most of the filling the field of view with the Quest Star. But with the uh, Teleview, I made a time lapse video showing the moon moving through the Earth's umbra, what we call the umbra, which is the Earth's shadow. Now, previously, we had told people about what time to look at this eclipse. We told them to the minute when partial phase would start, when the total phase would start, when the total phase would end, when the partial phase would end. You may wonder, how can we do that? Well, as it turns out, the heavenly bodies follow regular courses, and over the years, men have been able to measure very carefully those motions. A lunar eclipse can only happen at a full moon and only happen when the moon is near one of its nodes of its orbit. So sometimes when there's a full moon, the moon's too high or it's too low and the shadow of the Earth misses the moon. Only when it's near a node where it crosses the Earth's orbital plane around the sun can you get a lunar eclipse. And we know that information because we've been recording it for a very long time. You know, those motions are not random. They come about because the Lord sustains us creation uh, moment by moment. We know from Colossians 1, 16 and 17 and from Hebrews 1 and 3. And we understand that God does that in a consistent manner because he's a consistent God. He's created the world to be this way. He told us back in the day four account of Genesis 1 that the heavenly bodies serve several purposes, some of them being timekeeping. And they do keep very good time. For people who've studied this, this is not difficult to do. Okay, it is a little difficult. Computing an eclipse is not an easy thing to do. It's complicated, but it is doable. It's knowable because we live in a world that's created by a knowable creator who's also made the world around us knowable. So we do truly believe that God does declare his glory through his creation around us, particularly the heavenly bodies that we have. You may have not stayed up all night for that, but I took about an hour and a half nap after lunch on Thursday, and I stayed up all night until I got back to bed about 5.30 that, that morning. I didn't really get tired. I uh, was able to uh, drink a little caffeine. That kept me awake, but it's just the excitement of the whole thing, being able to record it. The people were with us. They had a wonderful time. And there were uh, two other people trying to take photographs of this as well. People took their cell phones and tried. I don't know how well they turned out on all of this. Now, photographing a total lunar eclipse is a little tricky because the light levels change so much. Our eyes respond to light very differently from the way cameras do. We say that our eyes respond lo logarithmically, which means we compress differences in brightness. That gives us a, what we call a huge dynamic range. We can go outside in the daytime. It's sunny right today. I could go out there and I can see just fine. Everything's illuminated with sunlight. But I can also go out at night and my eyes can adapt to the darkness and I can see very well. I can see faint starlight out there, even though it's millions of times less bright than the sun is. A camera has a hard time doing that because a camera responds linearly. When you double the amount of light, you don't get this compression. You get a doubling response in the camera. And on a camera, you can change that a couple of things when you're using a telescope. One is you can change the exposure time. I can't do that with my eyes. My eyes who are going to operate the way they do. But I uh, started off uh, taking pictures to the uh, Teleview telescope at uh, one two thousandth of a second. One two thousandth of a second, because the full moon is very bright. It wasn't an eclipse yet. But another thing I can change is the ISO setting on the camera. That uh, just how sensitive the camera, how much it responds. I start off with ISO 200, which was a pretty low setting. Later on, I increased it to 800. I could have gone a lot higher, 
but I decided to stick with that. In the meantime, I changed the exposure time. I went from uh, one two thousandth of a second to a thousandth to uh, a hundredth and then a fiftieth as, a sun, as the moon got dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. Finally, during totality, I was taking six second exposures. When you combine that exposure time and the, uh, the ISO settings, I changed the settings over a factor of 48,000 times. 48,000, that's a lot. But our eyes can compress that and we can see that. But the camera, since it responds linearly, doesn't record exactly what the eye sees. So getting a camera photograph of an eclipse, lunar eclipse, is just like what the eye sees, it's not an easy thing to do. Now, solar eclipses are really fascinating. I've been to three total solar eclipses so far, the most remarkable thing I've ever experienced in my life. Now, a lunar eclipse is not nearly as fantastic as a total solar eclipse. I've had the pleasure of going to a totality three times. It's quite remarkable what you can see. In fact, we ran an eclipse party in 2024 for the total solar eclipse as well. Lunar eclipses are still very interesting. Uh, you may think, well, the moon gets dark, but it doesn't get completely dark because the atmosphere of the Earth, as sunlight goes around, sunlight's coming from this direction, the Earth is here, the moon's over here, the Earth has an atmosphere, and the atmosphere bends light into the shadow of the Earth, so the Earth's umbra is not completely dark, unlike the moon's umbra during a solar eclipse. Consequently, the moon doesn't get completely black during a lunar eclipse. In fact, in totality, it's usually some shade of orange or red. I've seen pumpkin, orange, peach, I've seen many different colors. This last one, it was hard to describe. It was kind of gray with a little orange. I think it was a pretty dark eclipse, darker than most, because the brightness changes depending on what's going on with the atmosphere around the edge. So I find lunar eclipses to be very interesting. I've now seen 19 total lunar eclipses, and each one of them is very different. So I enjoy seeing them, just curiosity about what's going on, going on during totality. Many of the uh, photographs and time-lapse videos of the uh, lunar, lunar eclipses are done with the moon centered in this, and you see the shadow of the Earth move on to the the moon. Throughout the night, the moon seems to move from east to west, from people in the northern hemisphere that's left to right across the sky. And so how can you keep tracking? Well, if you don't have a, a motorized mount, you have to keep moving the camera or the telescope. Fortunately, the two telescopes I used with cameras on them had a motorized mount. I lined them up with the rotation axis of the Earth, and so consequently we were able to follow it uh, pretty nicely. Now I can do it a couple different ways. I can keep it centered on the moon, in which case the moon stays fixed, or on one of the telescopes, I can have it track the solar rate, which means I would keep the Earth's umbra fixed and the moon then moves through the umbra instead of the umbra seeming to move onto the moon. That can be a, a bit of an interesting situation. As it turns out, eclipses have become a little uh, controversial in recent years. There's been a flat Earth movement out there, millions of people all over the globe thinking the Earth is flat. Wait, you don't believe the Earth is round? Mm-hmm. That's right. The Earth ain't round. It's a big old pancake. They think the Earth is flat and round, and that there's a dome over top, and that the stars, the sun, and the moon are somehow in that dome that spins around every day like this. Well, if that's the case, the sun and the moon are always above the Earth. You can't get the Earth's shadow cast upon the moon to cause lunar eclipses. So they disagree with us what's going on during a lunar eclipse. And to try to prove that the conventional understanding of eclipses, that is the Earth's shadow falling on the moon, the flat earthers try to point out at least two things that they think are wrong. They say, first of all, the shadow of the Earth, if that's what it is, is going the wrong direction. They notice the moon is moving east to west, that is left to right across the sky. That would then suggest that there would be the shadow of the Earth here and you would move into it so it would go from right to left onto the moon. It turns out the shadow of the Earth goes left to right on the moon, not right to left. So they said it's going the wrong direction. Another thing they try to argue is that the uh, shadow changes direction. It comes in one way and moves off a different direction. So uh, one flat earther out there named uh, David Weiss has uh, put together such a video about this eclipse. And he calls it the impossible lunar eclipse path. And I'll take a good look at this video here. And as it goes, you can see the shadow moving in on the lower left, and that's exactly what it looked like the night that we did. It shows the arrow going in like that. By the way, you'll see it jump around a little bit, uh, and you'll see the light levels change. That's because there was a, a little adjustment had to be made because this telescope on this wasn't tracking perfectly. And you had to change the exposure times. Right now, the lit portion is a little overexposed, and I would say the unlit portion is a little underexposed. Now, this is during totality, and what's going to happen next is it's going to move off 
and it's going to indicate that the uh, shadow uh, moved off to the lower right. There it comes. There's the partial phase now at the end, and he shows the shadow now moving off to the lower right. And it does indeed sort of look like the shadow, whatever it is on the moon, changed directions. But did it? Let's see this conclusion here. He'll show you the two arrows. He'll compare them going in on the lower left, going out on the lower right. So he's asking if this really is what, uh, what's causing it is an Earth's shadow moving on the moon. Did the, did the Earth's shadow suddenly change direction and make a 90 degree angle turn? Well, the problem here is that he was using a video that was centered on the moon. Knowing that flat earthers do this quite a bit, this time around I did something different. Instead of following the moon, I followed the umbra. And I put together a time-lapse video from 922 photographs that I took during the total lunar eclipse recently. And we'll just look at that right now. I started doing this before totality. And you can see the, uh, the penumbral phase, that's called uh, sh penumbral shading taking place. The partial phase hasn't happened yet. That's gonna happen in a few minutes. There it comes, there it comes in that penumbra, uh, the umbra of the moon, of the Earth starting to move in. Now we got a few jumps here because we had some clouds move across and I stopped taking photographs when clouds were across, I couldn't see a thing. But you'll see it flickers too, as well as the, uh, the clouds go across. Keep in mind, I had to keep increasing the uh, exposure time and changing the ISO setting. Now we're in totality and here I'm running about six seconds. You can see the moon there, uh, very deep red looking color. Now I've shortened the exposure time a little bit and as we're moving along it's got a few more clouds and it's going to start uh, moving off again. Now did you see that moon change direction? No you didn't. The moon moved from upper right to lower left and kept moving the same direction. You see when you center on the moon it gives you the impression the umbra is moving and it's moving around but in reality the umbra isn't moving. It's the moon that's moving through the umbra. So when you center on the umbra, you don't get that impression, first of all, that it's going the wrong direction. It's going from right to left, so its shadow is gonna fall on the left side of the moon first and you move across, and then it's not gonna change direction. The umbra is a lot larger than the moon is. The moon is about 2,000 miles across. The Earth's umbra is around 5,000 miles across. And the moon moved through the upper part of the uh, Earth's umbra, or shadow. It didn't move right through the middle. That's why it gives you this impression that it rolled around. But if you look at it again, and centered on the umbra, you can see the moon move straight through. So both of those flat earther claims are incorrect. So did flat earthers finally catch us? Did they finally disprove the, uh, the conventional understanding of eclipses? No, they simply were misled by looking at incomplete information. Again, I can understand if you look at that photograph or time-lapse video done of the moon during uh, the eclipse centered on the moon, keeping the moon fixed in position, you're gonna get the impression the shadow's going the wrong way and even changing direction. But again, the shadow isn't moving. It's the moon that it's moving. If you keep the telescope centered on the shadow, you see the moon moves exactly the direction it's supposed to go. You know, the whole sky seems to to shift about 15 degrees per hour from left to right or east to west in the sky. The moon, because it orbits the Earth, is moving at about a half degree per hour the opposite direction. So during a solar eclipse, during a lunar eclipse, the moon is moving from right to left for people in the northern hemisphere, even though the whole sky is moving the other direction. There are two motions going on here, and flat earthers can't seem to understand that they're a second motion that they're not aware of. I want to encourage you to get out and enjoy God's creation. It does really declare God's glory, and astronomy is one of the best ways to do that. For instance, in April of 2024, we had a total solar eclipse across the United States, and we at Answers in Genesis had an eclipse party. Turned out the video we made was the most popular video we had of 2024. If you missed it, here's your chance. Just click on this video.